Transmitter that we sold and built and sold to uh, the Voice of America. And then uh, a few years ago, I and several people were lucky enough to uh, go out to California, and the government gave one to the Antique Wireless Museum in New York. And so I led a bunch of engineers out there to de install one of these. And so that's what most of what we'll talk about here. So, oops. Hit the little, uh, yeah. Whoops. Okay, these are the kind of things we'll just uh, spend a couple seconds on each, each slide here, but it's a little bit of the history of how the VOA got started. Uh, in a nutshell, at the end of World War II, our friends became our enemies and our enemies became our friends. And so all of a sudden there's the, the Cold War and a lot of it was, uh, was done in cyberspace today. Uh, both countries transmitting uh, uh, the news in their version to each other and jamming the other guy. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, there was a US uh, cutter courier that uh, we put shortwave broadcast transmitters on, drove it out into the Mediterranean. It had Collins transmitters on it. And if you can imagine uh, uh, high power on a ship out over the salt water, it worked very effective into the southern part of uh, the Iron Curtain. So next one. So this kind of shows some of the things that happened through the 80s and the 90s. And today, Voice of America is pretty much closed down. A lot of it that remains is uh, over satellite services. Next. Uh, a little more statistics. Uh, what's interesting, uh, if you go to Dayton, uh, south of Dayton at Bethany, there is a museum that uh, a bunch of people put together on the Bethany site. And they have a Collins uh, 821A 250-kilowatt transmitter there. Uh, the one we took out is located in uh, Delano. And uh, I think today the only thing that's really still going, there's a few transmitters on the air in, in North Carolina. Okay, next. Overseas, here's where all the uh, U.S. transmitting sites were. Uh, Collins was involved in, at various times in, in almost all of them that I know of. There's a few places where I just really don't know. Like Botswana, I don't know what we had there. Uh, Kavala, Greece, we, we had stuff in there. Uh, Monrovia, Libya, Liberia, I, at one time in my career, I talked to the manager of that station, and I think they had Collins. They had, most of it was all U.S. manufacturer equipment, as you'd imagine, from people. So here's uh, the history of what Collins did in this market, uh, starting out with a three kilowatt, which was really kind of small for this kind of service. That's one of the things that they put on the uh, courier and then the 207B. Uh, and these power levels, by the way, are carrier power for AM. So if you want to know what PEP is to coincide with your, your thinking with sideband, uh, add 6 dB to all these numbers. So like the 821A, 250 kW carrier, and then they would... Uh, modulate on the positive sides of the audio more than 100%. So it was a megawatt or better of PEP on these transmitters. And as you can imagine, they're quite expensive. We only made nine of them. And uh, the A21A was computer controlled and a little more advanced output network. And there were eight of those built and sold. Uh, this is the 21 or 231D, go ahead. We can put these slides up if you're really interested in all the statistics. Uh, there's a picture of the uh, courier uh, in the Mediterranean off of uh, the coast of Greece. So every ribbon is a diode, right? So the whole ship's off. It could be, yeah. <laughs> you can see some of the antennas. These are some of the higher frequency uh, broadband monopoles. And I think there's another slide. They put a wire up on a... Uh, 
on a uh, barrage balloon for an uh, antenna. But these are the transmitters on the Courier. And the, yeah, here, uh, there's a photo. They had a 900 foot wire that they would fly above the ship. And uh, there were two cases where the wire broke. I mean, you can imagine high winds and the seas are fighting each other and it broke the wire. The balloon drifted out over Turkey, crashed into something and there was a, you know, international incident. So, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, this is a photo taken on the Courier uh, of the uh, 35 kilowatt 207B. Several cabinets. There's the photo with the, the balloon up. Okay, the A21A, uh, just to kind of set the stage, uh, as I said, there were nine of them made. We delivered them in the uh, late 60s. And there were three installed at each of these three sites. And this is a big guy. There's uh, there's some of the specs on it. The tuning range was 4 to 26 megs. Uh, prime power was kind of interesting. You know, you think about maybe 440 or something like that. The prime power coming into the station for the high voltage transformer was over 4,000 volts three phase. <laughs> Big stuff. And, and there's, this, you know, half the size of a house to, to hold one of these. Uh, plate voltage, I think, was around 15,000, something like that. I don't know. I, I just resurrected this thing this afternoon. <laughs> okay, next one. Uh, the A2 was, uh, if you remember some of the history, Arthur was uh, wanting to integrate computer control with communications way back in the 60s, and so after the A1, uh, the triple CS system came along and uh, that transmitter was designed for computer control and uh, pretty advanced at the time. Uh, there's a couple of pictures and uh, this was uh, five of them delivered into Canada. The Canadian broadcast system used them and then three went to uh, Darwin, Australia. A lot of the specs are the same. Um, it's a bigger, heavier guy, though. 34 tons of a lot of its transformer. <laughs> okay, here's what a part of it. Uh, you, it's hard to get your mind around this, but uh, here, here's an 821A in, in the Toronto plant. A lot of the low-level stuff is in this, this rack cabinet here. You can see the ATR boxes. Uh, this is a test console. See, there's an HP 606 uh, Collins 51S receiver. Uh, this is the exciter. It's basically a three kilowatt transmitter. And then uh, this is a test console and some of the uh, uh, tank circuit and the final PAs are there. You can't see the modulator. It's all in, in the back. Okay. Here's the computer control, uh, I.O. devices, teletype machine. These are the guys that uh, were instrumental in making this thing happen. Um, Lonnie Duncan's about, I think he's 85 now. I talk to him ever so often, still sharp as a tack. He was pretty young at the time when he was the division head down in Dallas. Everybody else, I think, has passed away. Uh, you might recognize Vince DeLong. Uh, he was an engineer on it uh, and started the Long Branch over here in Cedar Rapids. So the rest of this is the uh, rescue of one of these. Uh, this happened back in 2014. Uh, the Antique Wireless Association, which is located in Bloomfield, New York, uh, was a qualified 501c3 that did some negotiation with the GSA uh, so that uh, they could formally give one of these transmitters to the AWA. And uh, the Collins Collectors Association was involved and they thought that th their grand plan was that the AWA gets it They've got to display it by New York law for a year and a half, and then they would give it to us, and it would come here to Cedar Rapids for, for display in a new museum, which so far hasn't happened. And I was kind of leery about the whole thing, but I was kind of interested in, in helping uh, take it out. So here's where we went. Uh, the, the transmitter site's uh, out west of Delano. It's in the desert in the, in the San Joaquin Valley. 
The whole transmitter side, I've got a lot of pictures here, it covers over a square mile. It was built in 1944, shut down in 2007. So it had been vacant property for, for seven or eight years by the time we got there. Uh, here's the front gate coming in. And this is in the center of the station, and this is where the control operators would set and monitor the programs. You know, they'd have several transmitters going at a time. And uh, here is a floor plan out of uh, the instruction book for a typical installation for one transmitter. Now, they had three of these, plus they had uh, several uh, continental transmitters and four or five made by a company in Switzerland, real old ones, Brown, Brown Bavaria. Uh, but these pictures might that follow, you can kind of get oriented a little bit. If you look at the front, you're, you're looking at this area, the three kilowatt driver amplifier is there and right behind it in a very nondescript box is, is the PA that generates the 250 kilowatts. And then the tank circuit is what they call a pie line. If you think about uh, at this power level, the plate load impedance is down there where the transmission line impedance is. So in order to tune this, you step up the impedance and then step it back down. And they do that with a, a transmission line that they call a pie line that's loaded periodically with uh, vacuum capacitors. And so that pie line comes vertical and then across here and then down. And then there's a high power tuned ballon to get it to a uh, balanced 600 ohm feed line then that exits the building. Uh, behind it then is another cage that's the, uh, uh, it's about 150 kilowatt audio amplifier. <laughs> and it uses a pair of really big tubes in it. And then in a full separate room is, is the power supply. They call it a high voltage vault. And you can literally walk into the power supply and look at the rectifiers and the transformers and there's all kinds of protection circuits so if there's some overload or something you don't cause a problem with the rest of the station so uh, it's hard to describe but lots of uh, lots of things to keep a fault off of that 4,000 volt prime power line. So here's the front. Uh, one of the neat things they did was, uh, and it's hard to see here, but there's, this is a diagnostic panel, and there's a block diagram of the whole transmitter right here and, and fault lights along there. So a guy can just walk up to it and say, ah, we know which box to go see where the fault is, why it won't tune. Uh, a lot of this is power supply, power supply control. And what you're doing is looking down the hall, and there's actually three, the fronts of three transmitters here. Uh, this one, and then another one here, and then the third one way in the background. Okay. So there's the three kilowatt driver amplifier. If you look inside of it, it looks very, very similar to a Collins 28U3. In fact, that's how they adapted from, from that design. Okay. The final PA, uh, a lot of people call it water tu cooled tubes. They're actually vapor phase tubes pump cold water into the anodes and then it flashes to the boiling point and that that phase change takes a lot of heat away from the copper and so then then you've got high pressure steam coming off of this thing so the whole thing has to be pressurized and that's all inside this box Do they recycle that water? Do they that yeah the water the, the steam goes up to uh, it goes up on the roof and there's these big condensers they look like huge air conditioning things and it circulates through there with large fans that bring it back to water and then it comes, comes back through the system. So here, you still can't see very much of it, but here's the pipe that takes the high pressure steam out and away and up, up to the roof. And uh, these are, uh, this, is, this is water coming in on these tubes. Uh, right here you see one of the gear trains for one of the uh, uh, vacuum capacitor tuning assemblies. And there's quite a story with this. There's most, most places along this pie line, there's four vacuum variables. Each one's about this long and about that deep. And initially, they designed that to be uh, air-cooled. And they delivered one. And after a while, they started having failures in the in these capacitors 
And the solution was they had to go back to Jennings and water cool the vacuum capacitors. <laughs> and Lonnie Duncan told me, he says, it cost both companies a lot of money. He says, those first few transmitters, we didn't make a dime on it because we had to correct that problem. So I'll show you some of those uh, capacitors. But there's the pie line that goes overhead. This, whoops, back up one. This was interesting. This is the bottom of the pie line. And this is uh, something like four feet across, this, this whole aluminum box. Well, right here is melted aluminum. They had an arc inside there sometime. <laughs> OK. OK, then it comes across the top and then drops down. And, and here's the pie line coming down in this section. And then it comes across. And in here is the the ballon, the tuned ballon to get from uh, 600 ohms unbalanced to 600 ohms balanced. And uh, we'll get back into that. Here's the modulator. There's a 4CV100,000 tube here and another one here. And the driver sets here, it's a 3 kilowatt tube. And you can see the, the steam uh, pipes coming out. This all has to be insulated and then finally the copper takes the the steam all the, all the way. So here's the crew that we started with. Uh, uh, Vince, uh, the fellow here in the center, was the, the caretaker, caretaker for the government. And so he had to be with us all the time to kind of monitor it and make sure. But he, he did wind up helping us too. Uh, these are some of the pieces that we took out. and. Uh, we spliced pallets together because they were wider than, than a standard pallet. And so here's like the diagnostic panel. Here's one of the power supply control panels. Okay. Uh, this is the modulator on the right and power supplies and uh, some sort of uh, automatic voltage control. We kind of staged all this in one hallway. And uh, Tim here kind of helped wrap things up. Here's the driver amplifier, the three kilowatt. Initially, we planned to uncable everything to preserve all that. Well, it was just was not practical. So we wound up cutting cables. So you'll see cables that are cut and dangling. Well, almost. We <laughs> can tell a couple war stories here. I was worried about safety. I mean, really. We should have been wearing hard hats in all these pictures. Uh, we had one guy come down after we had started, volunteered to help, and I was facing the wall, and he was on a stepladder behind me, and he had a sawzall. And the other guy that was kind of checking to make sure that, I mean, we still had to have lights and AC for our power tools. He says, "Yep, all these cables are cold." So he's he's cutting through one of them with a with a sawzall. Uh, uh, and it was in a conduit. Well, there was 2083 phase live in there, and he hit that, and I saw the flash come off of the, the wall, and I turned around just to see him do a nosedive into the concrete. <laughs> so I jumped up, and he's just laying there. I thought, oh my God, you know, I felt for a pulse in his neck, and about that time he opens his eyes, and he's, I says, are you all right, are you all right? And he says, well, I think so. <laughs> Well, needless to say, it uh, caused my heart to beat fast. Uh, so here's the pie line. We're getting a lot of it disassembled now. And we're down to the pie line coming down. And here you can see the servo drives for the tuning. OK. OK, here's uh, I'll give you an idea of the magnitude of that. Each one of these is a servo assembly. You can see the gear trains and the, the capacitors you can't see back yet. So there's a stack of them here going up the vertical part of the, of the pie line. And each one of these assemblies weighs about 300 pounds because it's, you know, the copper and these things are huge. So the problem was you can't just reach out here with so many guys and pick up 300 pounds. So we searched around the station, found a, a little trolley and some U channel, do the next one, and uh, we can take them out that way. To give you an idea, here's the size of these guys. Here's the butt end of the four vacuum capacitors. Okay, and there's the servo assembly. Here's here's the U channels to 
and the little trolley that we bolted onto it to, to roll it out where we could handle it. There's the rest of the trolley. And you can see those uh, plastic tubing, that's the water cooling coming in. Okay. And then here's the ones after we've got them out to show you what a whole assembly looks like here. The vacuum capacitors, the gear trains, the motors with the chain drives above it. How tall is that from the bottom to the top, right? Uh, probably about four feet, I think. Yeah. I'm wondering if they possibly forgot that vacuum is the best heat insulator you can have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a huge amount of current through these things. <laughs> this is what really surprised me.